All right, welcome back. We are INFR 2350, Intermediate Computer Graphics in the Winter 2021 20, semester at Ontario Tech University. And um, it's Tom. <laughs> and we're back again. And it's lecture two, uh, part one of our, um, of our broadcast. Uh, it's all about shaders today, but we're also going to be briefly talking about assignment one, as well as in-class exercise one. Uh, which is going to be due this Friday. So let me talk about that, those two things. Just to remind you of where we are right now, we're sitting at uh, week two. Uh, we're doing the synchronous portion, week two A. Week one B, asynchronous last week, uh, didn't fly for me for some some reason or another. I had some technical issues. I had to reboot my computer several times and I ran out of time. So what I'm going to do is I'm probably going to take uh, the video that I'm supposed to do for that week and insert it this week. Um, you'll see it come up later on, and I'll describe uh, the GDW requirements there, as well as some um, OOP requirements that I recommend. Okay, so that's that. Uh, but this afternoon, you're going to see me uh, kind of uh, go into detail about uh, kind of reviewing the graphics pipeline in more detail and instance rendering. That's going to happen async. I'm going to do the graphics pipeline at a very high level right now, as well as talk about shaders and then Nick RTA is going to go into more detail later on on Friday um, on how to use shader program. And you've, you should already know how to do some of that stuff uh, already from intro to graphics. So it's going to be a bit of a review for you, which is a good thing. So that is uh, the plan for this week. Um, again, I, I always post the outline and let, let us know where we're at and so that you can see what's due um, and what's happening. Uh, next week, we're, uh, assignment one is due by Sunday at midnight. And um, assignment two will be released next week, as well as checkpoint one. So when we get together next week um, for checkpoint one, what I'm looking for uh, for you guys is to kind of show me where you're at with your um, your GDW um, project. So where are you? Um, you're, there's a mark related to checkpoint one. What I'm looking for is a couple of slides. Uh, one slide, well, when I say a couple of slides, a few slides, one slide will be for, um, um, you know, about what your game is about, like who are you, what's your team name, what's your game name, uh, that kind of stuff. There'll be another slide that's going to be uh, uh, kind of a mugshot of all your team members that I'm going to ask for. So there's going to be a, some slide requirements. Um, and then I'm going to get into um, what you're doing from a lighting perspective. Uh, and all that kind of stuff. You'll see that there'll be a requirement for uh, for the GW stuff uh, that I'll be asking for. So I'll post the requirements for the slides today. You'll see that coming up. Please take a look at that. Um, that's something I'm going to do offline. Um, but really, it's not that many slides. It's not going to be a full GW presentation that I'm looking for. So it's not like I'm looking for um, something like you know what you're going to give to Gavin. It's going to be a shortened version. Maximum time that I'm looking for for your checkpoint next week is five minutes. So for uh, just a note uh, about this, for next week for the note taker that's online, there won't be a formal lecture during our lecture hour. Um, I will do our formal lecture during our asynchronous period. But during our synchronous time together, I'm going to pull you guys into different rooms. Um, and then, again, it'll probably happen up on Discord where I take a look at your um, GDW, the state of your GDW game as it is right now, I think is one of, is one of the things I'm going to be looking at next week, as well as, um, you know, uh, what your plan is, which is really what Checkpoint 1 is all about, what your plan is to complete all the GDW aligned requirements for me uh, by the end of uh, semester. So um, one thing I'm going to be doing later on today is opening up group sign up for GDW. If you are a non-GDW student, you still need to sign up for GDW some kind of group, right? So, um, and if you need um, GDW uh, or to uh, kind of help joining a group, um, let's make sure that you point that out. Is there anybody right now, I want to ask this question, is there anyone right now who needs assistance uh, with finding a group, and if you are, can you please put your um, indicate that with a check mark that you need assistance finding a group in the participants panel? Um, so there's a couple. Adam and Jaden are indicating they need uh, group members. Worst case, Adam and Jaden, um, you can work together. 
is there anyone else physically present that um again is needs a and tavis okay so tavis so maybe what what i can ask is um i'm not sure if you know each other i'm not going to force you to work together either i however i recommend that if there's three of you together in a nice little group um i don't think it's a bad number to start with i know that gw groups are between um five and six uh this this semester but yeah, there you go. There's there's like at least four of you. It looks like Joseph, uh, Tavis, Jaden, Adam. What you can do is maybe you can talk offline and as an example on Discord. Um, and you can go into the discussion, uh, you know, kind of inside of our second year uh, where it says lectures, uh, you know, kind of a, a chat area. Maybe you want to go in there later on after this and have a conversation with each other and then connect. Uh, and kind of form a little group for this this uh, class where you can satisfy the requirements that you would otherwise be doing for GDW. The other option is you can combine with other GDW teams um, that are groups of five, as an example, that can use additional help when it comes to graphics requirements. I'm totally fine with that as well. So if you'd like to do that or combine together as one big group, I'm okay. A group of four is not bad, and I think you can accomplish a lot. Okay, so. Guys, please, uh, I will note this. I'm going to have a transcript of the chat after this class. And worst case scenario, what I'll do is I'll reach out to you guys and I'll see if you guys can at least work together in a group. So that's what's happening next week. Uh, that's coming up. Um, and again, we're not too far off from um, some of the stuff we're doing. So this week is assignment one, and I want to go into the details of assignment one now. Um, so we're also going to be talking about shaders and in-class exercise one, which is due Friday, but I want to quickly run through assignment one details, which is now posted up on, um, canvas. So if you look up on canvas in week two, there's going to be lecture two, which is what I've posted already in class exercise one, which is going to be due Friday as well as assignment one, the basics, uh, which is what I've called it. Um, and that's due January 31st. That's Sunday, January the 31st at midnight. Okay, and that's an individual assignment that you'll be doing on your own uh, to basically practice your skills uh, with graphics. If you had trouble with intro to, intro to graphics, it'll give you another shot at putting together a very simple assignment. And your TA, Nicholas, is going to help you with the assignment framework this Friday, um, which is going to make sure that, you know, uh, it's in line with what you're doing for assignment one. Okay, let's take a look at assignment one really briefly. Um, and then we'll move on from there. So I'm just going to pull up assignment one. All right, so assignment one is called The Basics, due January 31st, 2021 at midnight. As individual, uh, you will demonstrate your knowledge of basic rendering that you learned from Intro to Graphics, and you will implement simple lighting. You'll activate several shaders and effects uh, that affect how each object renders in the scene. You may use the assignment framework provided to you by your TA. And this, of course, is Otter. Um, when I say you may use, you don't have to use it. If you choose to use your own framework, let's say, for example, you have a, a framework that you're using for your GDW game that's different than Otter, um, and then it satisfies the same requirements, I'm okay with that, as long as um, you, know, you satisfy the requirements of the assignment, okay? And I'm not going to require you to use any kind of specific windowing system like GLFW, uh, or glut or something like that, you can use whatever windowing system that makes sense to you. Um, and what I mean by windowing system is where you're going to render your OpenGL context. All right. Um, the assignment is weighted 5% of your final mark, and it's to be done individually. As a base, what you're going to be doing is can you construct this very simple scene with multiple objects? Again, um, you're going to create a camera that moves around the world with some kind of predefined movement, or you can control it. So almost like a little camera controller with a game pad, mouse, keyboard combination. Um, objects and or characters should be dynamic in some way. So they should be moving around. And the scene should be somehow aesthetically pleasing. So don't give me a really ugly scene to look at. Um, and again, Nick is going to look at that too. Um, so that's worth 30 points. That's your base. So you're just going to create a very simple scene. And right here, we're not even talking about lighting. This could be unlit at this point, right? Uh, part two is uh, you're going to implement lighting. So you're going to use uh, your implement, implement diffuse uh, shader, uh, ambient, and specular, as well as um, you're going to use Fong model per pixel lighting. And each term 
we're going to talk about terms and shading and all that stuff, and you should know about this already, should be toggled using either the keys below or uh, GUI toggles. And again, using some kind of uh, UI element. Okay, so that's how it'll be turned off. And you're actually going to get paid for this in points and marks uh, to do the toggling. So it's going to be further down. Um, I'm also going to ask you to implement an optional shader. So there's a shader of your choice um, or an effect. <clears throat> such as rim lighting, tune shading, et cetera, whatever you decide to use. Uh, I want you to make it interesting, something that makes your scene pop or something that you really want to do uh, that you've been interested in doing. This is an opportunity for those people who love computer graphics to kind of come up with something cool. That's the optional shader that you're going to get marked for. And then, oh, this is part three as well. Ha ha ha. This should be part four and this should be part five. I'll update that. Um, part four is debug with toggle keys slash UI buttons. So when I press the one key or some kind of button, again, you can use I am GUI, which is built into your Otter framework. Then um, it'll, you know, kind of toggle no lighting. So it'll be, you know, nothing is on. Then you can turn ambient lighting on, specular, ambient and specular. And finally, number five would be amb ambient, specular, and plus your custom shader slash effect, whatever it is that you want. Okay. So that is your debug keys. You're getting paid 20 points for that. And finally, your demo video. So there is no assignment um, report that I'm asking for in this course. From now on, um, I'm not going to ask you to write a big report other than the GDW report. Okay. Or if I ask you to make a blog as an example for an in-class exercise, um, that's the only time that you're going to see that. The rest of the time, you're going to be making these videos, like I said last time. So... So you're going to make it for this particular part, um, a demo video, it's worth 10 points. And you're going to have a single slide in the video that's going to basically have an image of you, current image, can't be avatars, so no, no funny things or computer characters or whatever else you want. Your full name, student ID, course code, course name, and your assignment information must be posted on your first slide. So this is kind of like a title slide of who you are and the assignment that you're, you're creating. You will demonstrate your app's functionality. So show me your assignment working and your UI must be clearly visible. So I need to see your user interface. Um, you will describe your code, algorithms, math, logic behind your implementation as best as you can to your best knowledge. Okay, that's what you're going to do. Um, so talk about your code. Show me how you did your, um, your shaders, your shader program, um, your optional shader, all that stuff, uh, and how you implemented uh, IAM GUI. It doesn't have to be like really deep because you only have five minutes to do everything. And I really mean that five minutes to basically talk about your code, which means show me your stuff, talk about your code. And, um, and that's really it. One thing to note is that your video must be a, at appropriate level so I can hear you and I can see your screen. If I can't see your screen and I can't hear you, the video is no good. All right. So it'll be considered that you didn't give me a video. All right. Just show me a video and I can't hear or see it. It's not a video. All right. To submit, you must submit a GitHub link um, as an example for your file. So I'm not going to you know, ask you to, to upload a zip archive or anything like that. It's going to be a GitHub repository link. So if you don't know how to use GitHub, um, talk to your TA. Uh, there's some really cool resources that you can learn on how to do that. You can use any tool to put things up on GitHub. If you want to use uh, Source Tree or you want to use Gitkraken or you want to use Command Line or you want to use Visual Studio, the stuff that's built in there. It's totally up to you how you want to do this. It doesn't matter to me as long as I get your completed project um, submitted and on time. You also must include a video link to this five-minute presentation. And by the way, you can use any way to create your video. I highly recommend OBS um, as a way of doing it. You can also, there's also other ways of doing it with Zoom and Teams and a bunch of other ways. Any way is good as long as I can see your video. However, take at this, take please note, there's a special note here, which is, there's a couple notes. This is a special note, which is assignments will not be accepted without a working video link. This is for academic integrity purposes. So I want to know that it's you. Um, I want to know that um, you're describing your code and your stuff. That's how we're going to do it this semester. So you need to submit a video. It's important. Even though it's only worth 10 marks out of 100, it's a mandatory requirement. Um, note. Any external code, internet stuff that you use or whatever, you must um, get approval for if it's outside of the stuff that you know how to do. Um, and it shouldn't be more than 10% of your code. I didn't say that here, but that's what I'm going to be looking for. So if you've just downloaded somebody's code and made it work, yeah, no, 
that's not going to be good enough. Um, inappropriate file names will also not be graded, so don't please don't give me something weird. Uh, make sure it, it's reflective of you. Maybe your name and your student ID might be a good idea. Um, would engine code from our GW members be fine? Yeah, that's good. I'm talking about external code from like Stack Overflow or something crazy or from some other place, all right? That would not be cool. So please, if you're going to use external code, make sure you annotate it, you cite it, and you, you uh, let your TA and me know why you're using it, why you need it. Um, and if, you, if you're not sure, make sure you, you email us so that way you're, we're good. And if, if it makes sense, if you're trying to do something really cool and you've got this really cool algorithm that you want to use that you saw some pseudocode on or something online you've been researching, I'm okay with it, but I need to know what it is, that it's not yours, that you kind of are, are implementing something that's already been, been made. Um, any questions we'll ask you uh, for clarifications and deadlines are final. So please consider uh, how long it takes to commit repositories um, and as well as anything else, like don't wait to the last minute, like we talked about before uh, and many times. There's also a simple rubric that I put down. I'm gonna fill this out and I'll update the, the details, but basically what's gonna happen is I'm gonna follow this simple rubric, which is you're gonna get marked for, if you're above and beyond, you get 100. If it's well thought out, your implementation get 85, decent is 70, basic is 50 and so on. And um, so again, the base is worth 30, basic lighting is worth 30, optional shader is worth 10, debug features is worth 20, and your demo video is worth 10. Do you have to make the models or can you get them online? I'm totally fine with you acquiring your models. You don't have to be uh, to get them. However, if you're somebody who is a uh, who's interested in 3D graphics to make 3D graphics and you're enrolled and of course in Gavin's class, then I think it makes sense for you to uh, to use some of the models that you're already making for that class uh, for this class. So that's totally fine to do as well. So I think it's good, especially if you're going to use a uh, mesh loader anyway. I don't need them to be complex and uh, at all. They just need to be lit. Okay, and we're going to talk about that. And you can definitely use your GDW objects. In fact, if you want to use um, some of your GDW, a scene from your GDW as a base, as long as it satisfies the requirements, I'm good. Okay. In fact, I don't want it to detract from what you're doing. Okay. I'm going to move away from this now. I'm going to take extra questions for this offline. You can send me questions through Discord and so, and so on. I only have an hour left to satisfy everything else we need to do. So I don't want to take too much of, my, of, of our time here. Uh, with this piece, but I wanted to bring it up because it's a first assignment and I want to make sure that everyone knows. I think it's a very straightforward assignment, guys, and it's totally doable. It's worth 5% of your final grade and doing January 31st. Uh, please make time for this. Don't wait to the last minute to get it done. I think you can do a lot with this and it's great for learning. And it's also going to support your work that you're going to do for me uh, during your midterm exam. So if you don't do this assignment, the midterm exam will be very difficult. Okay, so please do this. All right. That's it for that. Let's move on to uh, the next piece, which is um, I want to talk about the in-class exercise uh, very briefly. All right, so let's talk about this as well. So in-class exercise, like I talked about, they're going to happen periodically. They're each worth two and a half percent of your mark. Uh, for today, you're going to go to something called Shader Toy. So if you haven't had a chance to look at Shader Toy, please go there now. Um, if you haven't had a chance to uh, to make a profile, you may want to make a profile for Shader Toy. But we're going to talk about this today. And what I'd like you to do is find something really cool on Shader Toy. And Shader Toy is pretty cool because um, what you can do is do some very simple uh, lighting and effects uh, right up on the web. All right. So not sure if you guys have ever seen this before, but ShaderToy.com is something that we're going to be using. Uh, I'm also going to mention it today during lecture. So again, take a look at a really interesting, cool effect that you like. That's the, the exercise, right? So let's suppose I really like this one, this little effect here. And you can see that there are, you know, there's water kind of effects like uh, here. And you can see that the shader um, is happening right in here. You can monkey with the shader. You can fool around with the shader. And what I want you to do is take a screenshot of the original effect, right? and then modify some stuff, modify some properties, attributes, colors, whatever, and then take a screenshot of the final effect, all right? And you're gonna submit both the original screenshot and the final effect 
uh, you know, so you can get your marks. That's really what I'm looking for. It would also be nice to, sh to see what the shader coat is. However, I haven't asked for that as a requirement for this first uh, uh, little in-class exercise. But it's really cool what you can do here. And um, we'll be talking about shaders today. So let's go into that. Let's suppose I want to make a new shader. As an example, I can click on new. Again, please follow me here. It's shadertoy.com uh, forward slash new. And um, there are some amazing um, stuff here that we have. Notice that what we have is some kind of strobing like uh, effect that's happening. Why? Because we are using the iTime uh, kind of variable that's built in, uh, you know, to this. If you look at the top for shader inputs here, you can see that there are a bunch of predefined uniforms, all right, that you can tap into. So I time, I time delta, I frame, and so on. And again, this is assuming that you've never seen Shader Tone before. If you have, forgive me, I'm talking to the people who haven't seen this before. If you've seen it, awesome, you know what to do. So let's say, for example, I want to um, modify uh, my frag color. Right now, it looks like there's a color plus some kind of transparency or alpha transparency value right there, the A value. And let's say, for example, I wanted to change that in real time uh, to 0.5, right, as an example. Uh, and if I compile it right away, right, it'll actually change the values along with whatever I do here. And let's say I can fool with these, with these values. Let's say, for example, I want to do something like weird, and I change the values to something else, and I save it you know, and I compile it, then you can see that there, you're going to get an immediate different color for what's happening. Um, if I don't want this to strobe or move like this, I can stop it or I can animate it. So this is shader toy. So you can look at somebody else's shader. And what I want you to do is modify the shader to make a really cool effect. It's going to take some time for you guys to look into that and see what to do. Um, if you don't know what a shader is, then we're going to be talking about shaders today. So if you look up online for, uh, let's take a look here on, on Canvas. And if we look, there's ice, the in-class exercise one, two and a half percent, it's worth 10 points and it's due January 22nd. That's this Friday at midnight. Okay, that's when the in-class exercise is due. So you have a couple of days to uh, investigate, try different effects. And the what we're looking for here for you to do is some kind of effort. If you just literally change a color or something, I mean, you know, that's the bare minimum. Um, what I'm looking for is, hey, can you make a really cool effect? Can you change this? And I, and I kind of think of shaders as this, as this one big, massive math calculation. That's what it really is. Uh, or some kind of uh, real-time math formula um, is, what I, is what I kind of think of shaders as. If you can change it to make it cool, that's awesome. Um, Yes, that would be enough, Jonathan. Anything like that, if you can manipulate something that's online to make a cool little effect with Shader Toy, I think that satisfies the requirements. It's basically practice for you for shaders uh, for this week. That's what it really is. Um, I also don't mind if you try it a couple times. You don't have to just you know submit one. You can try a bunch of different ones. This is just something that I want you to do to practice, and you're getting paid 2.5% of your final grade for it. So I think it's worth doing, right? Yeah, so let me go into that in a second. And so if you look at the assignments details, if I look at ICE 1, if I look at the assignment details, it says search for an interesting shader example, modify its color properties and at least two other variables. So things like, or properties and attributes so that it delivers a different and interesting effect or look. And I say experimentation is good. So submission details, a screenshot of the original effect and a screenshot of your, of your, your version, your final version. That's what I'm looking for, just two screenshots for two and a half percent of your final grade. I don't think there's an easier in-class exercise you can possibly do, right? So, um, and I think it's uh, good practice and lots of fun if you try it out. So um, again, this is due, you can hand this in at any time and it's due by Friday at midnight, okay? We're gonna do again, four of these. This is gonna be the easiest of the four, um, but again, it's just to get you started, to get you thinking and um, to get you practicing using uh, shaders. There's some great um, tutorials on shaders as well. So if you go to the main page for shadertoy.com, um, I highly recommend take a look at some of these tutorials. Let's see if I can go there and leave. 
and sign up for your, um, as an example, uh, a free account for Shader Toy. It'll allow you to make your own custom shaders. And today, for whatever reason, it's really slow. Um, we'll be also we'll also be doing the same kind of effect with uh, Visual Studio Code later on this semester if we can. And we'll also hit uh, hit this with uh, Visual Studio, so you have a chance to do this a couple of times. Yeah, this is really slow today for whatever reason for me. Maybe it's really super fast for you, but for me, it's super slow. Um, so yeah, let's. Uh, it's slow for you too. Yay! It's not just me. Okay, so it was super laggy when I went on. Yeah, same. It's gonna. You know what? It is what it is, guys. Um, there's also uh, as an alternative. Um, there's other options online uh, to do the same thing, and especially since we're all hitting it at the same time, I'm sure that uh, just us alone, it's making it really, really slow. And I'm not sure, I don't think they're being funded, uh, you know, that's why they're asking for a Patreon kind of uh, funding and so on. Let me see if I can do that one more time. I don't think it's going to make a difference at this point. It's just cycling. So the other way to do it is with VS Code. And for those people who don't know, I'm just going to go to VS Code. So if you look at, uh, uh, for those people who don't know, there's something called Visual Studio Code out there. Um, you guys should know about Visual Studio Code. It is an editor, a script editor that you can use as well for the same effect. So Visual Studio Code, um, it's like Visual Studio Lite. Yeah, I know we killed it, Sam. I see that on Discord. Um, uh, Visual Studio, it's like Visual Studio Lite and it does, it's kind of a scripting editor. Um, and what you can do with it, which is pretty cool, and I'm just going to bring up um, some examples of this. So Visual Studio Code, I mean, you can use it for scripting. So here's JavaScript as an example. Totally use it for scripting. But you can also, if I close my uh, folder here, let's close my folder. You can also download and install uh, support for shaders. So if I, talk, if I just like look at GLSL as an example, um, there's something called GLSL Canvas uh, that you can use in Visual Studio Code, and it'll actually render shaders in real time. One thing to note that this is using GLSL uh, or OpenGL ES, not the OpenGL that we're used to, um, but it'll actually do um, you know shader code, and you'll actually see the effects in real time right next to it in the in the panel. So. Again, one or the other is cool. You can grab a shader uh, again from online and modify it, and you know, show me the original and show me your modifications. And I think this would satisfy your practice. So there's some really cool things that you can grab. And another time when we have more time than an hour for the lecture, I'll go into Visual Studio Code using GLSL Canvas and show you what that looks like. Okay, one more time with Shader Toy, and hopefully uh, it's not dead. Yay, it's not dead anymore. So on the bottom on the right there, there is Shader Toy um, tutorials, where it says Shader Toy uh, coding intro. Um, you can It's a YouTube video, so I can't really show it here, but if you go to this video right here, it talks about how to do Shader Toy. It explains very simply how to do a lot of little effects. And I think it's a great little tutorial to get your... Um, you know, to get you into doing shading and how to create a little, uh, you know, frag shader is what this really is, right? So go into it. I think it's a really good one. There's also another tutorial uh, that I like as well, which is another by by this another video tutorial series, um, and it says Shader Toy Unofficial, um, where they talk a lot of different things in terms of uh, what you can do. As well as if you were to search for Shader Toy, if I type in Shader Toy um, tutorial, then what you're going to see is there's a bunch of tutorials online uh, just for this. So take a look at this. I think there's some really great things that you can learn just by um, kind of going online and following some tutorials. And also, um, I know that Nick is probably going to, you know, kind of hit it with you guys from. Um, you know, making shaders with you guys live on Friday. So please uh, make time to attend, like I said, your first tutorial on Friday. All right, so um, so let's go back to here. So any questions around in-class exercise one, 
as well as uh, assignment one before I move on to the lecture content. I know it's uh, kind of a lot that I'm giving at once, but I think it's uh, it's great to get your feet wet, if you will, and get yourself coding. No panic attack, guys. It's really, really straightforward. And I think that you'll see once uh, Nick gives you, the, gives you the framework again and goes through Otter with you guys on Friday, for those people who have forgotten or who are not great at computer graphics, I think it's going to make it a lot easier. Um, so, Jonathan, I was, I was recommending, if you're going to use the, uh, uh, Visual Studio Code, uh, GLSL Canvas is pretty cool, but you need to configure it. And if you actually look at um, uh, VS Code for GLSL, if you look for a tutorial, I can recommend some tutorial uh, links later. What I'll do is I'll, maybe what I'll do is I'll post it up on Canvas, some really cool links, uh, because there's a bit of configuration you have to do for VS Code in order for it to work. Um, and But once you get it going... Uh, it's amazing what you can what you can do in a, a very short time. And since you're asking, I know we digress, <laughs> but it's uh, it's part of what we do. Um, let me just see if I can um, if I can pull something in here, which is going to be fairly uh, easy to do, and it's not going to require a shader or any kind of uh, yeah, I don't think I have anything that I can show you right now that isn't a full um, Visual Studio Code example that I, want, I don't want to ruin it for you. So yeah, give me um, let me get into that uh, with you, and what I'll do is I'll I'll send you the um, kind of some of the the examples online. I think it's pretty straightforward, um, you know, as you'll see. Right, so let me see if that suffices it. Yeah, this is one. So here's an example of a test frag. Right, here's a fragment shader um, in VS Code. And what you can do is you can you can launch it, um, but you need to configure it. So for if you notice here, it says code language not supported or defined. There's a bit of setup that you have to do when you have a frag shader. Uh, but this is an example of what a frag shader would look like. So notice how it says GLSL down here. Uh, it's nice. It detects the language. But the problem with this is uh, what I want to show is on the right side, I want to kind of run it with, um, and I think there's a way of doing it, but um, it's using a uh, a setup that I'm going to talk about later on. Okay, so that's how you do it. You kind of code it in, 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 um, in VS Code. And then once you code it, the uniforms are different. So instead of uh, I resolution, you have U resolution. Uh, that's in uh, in VS Code, but the the effects would be the same. So pretty cool stuff. And again, we'll talk about this later on. Okay. Um, can be used for just general GLSL writing. Yeah, you can. Yeah, I think you can experiment with GLSL. You can actually lift almost all the effects from Shader Toy. And from anything you find online and like literally drop that into a frag shader and it'll have the effect that you're looking for. And there's tons and tons of, uh, of examples online. Okay, let's move on because before we, we, we move into this, I can continue um, with this, but then we're not going to get the lecture uh, slides done and that would be not good. So um, again, what we've been using in the past, now moving into the lecture uh, portion, guys, is the fixed function pipeline which had um, a lot of limitations. So here's an example of the fixed function pipeline. The biggest problem with this thing was it was way too slow. So you have to think about hardware way back when. Um, you couldn't configure the functions and you were only able to tell uh, the functions what to do, but the configuration was very, very low. So again, um, it, the pipeline kind of looked like this, where you have your vertex and index list, you pass it into the transform and lighting, and then it kind of goes in from one thing to the other. Very similar to what we do today, but our, our pipeline is a lot more complex and more flexible. So we're going to be using shaders from now on. And what are shaders? They're small pieces of code that are executed by graphics hardware. Um, there are uh, vertex shaders, and the main ones that we're going to be using are uh, those ones, vertex shaders and fragment shaders and others. We're going to be talking about that today. They really allow you to cheat for speed. And I really love that line. Um, and the reason why it allows you to cheat for speed is because um, 
you know, again, they're a mathematical calculation and we can use math to really create a really cool effect. Um, and they tell OpenGL, our framework, how to draw stuff. And they help define a style of rendering for us. Okay. So that's really what shaders are. Okay. So what's changed really at the end of the day, um, we were able to start programming, uh, you know, GPUs again back in 1992, approximately kind of a, a background to shaders. NVIDIA was one of the first, uh, I would say, companies that contributed to, um, to writing OpenGL extensions. And remember, back in the day, back in 1992, um, and you guys don't remember this, there was no AMD uh, the way they have it today. AMD was a second-rate CPU manufacturer back in the day. Yes, it was ATI. And uh, they were bought. ATI was actually bought by AMD, um, I think, around the 90s again as well. And then they became a way better company. I think overall, they became a much more uh, diverse company that makes competitive CPUs and competitive GPUs uh, that are awesome. In fact, if I can say anything, um, I think the ATI CPU, the GPUs back in the day, were probably better in many ways than the NVIDIA uh, GPUs that they had come up with. And why? Because they were the first, um, the first people to come up with really cool um, discrete graphics cards. And, um, but again, they were beat up by NVIDIA for some time until they, they made a real, real comeback uh, over the last, uh, I would say, five years or so. Um, and they've been kind of neck and neck, I would say, in different ways, um, you know, for, for a long time. But I would say definitely in, over the last five years, they've like really pulled ahead, especially from a price perspective and the things that you can do with the GPU. Um, and we have great support from AMD. Um, Ontario Tech University is, is uh, we have an affiliation with AMD when it comes to how we, they kind of, um, in, in real, kind of in normal times, I would say, they've come to our GamesCon. We've had representatives from them in our gamer labs, uh, all kinds of really cool stuff. And we don't have that same representation from NVIDIA. So props to AMD. All right. Um, so again, Texas Instruments, again, a bit of a background. Uh, they created the first programmable GPU in 1985. Um, so again, am I going to ask you a question like this on the final test or something? Nope, I'm not going to do it. And you get the slides here anyway, but it's good to understand history. And so what they did was they made this programmable C uh, GPU. It was a very simple card. Um, it got extremely hot. By the way, I remember, um, you know, this chip because I've been around for a while. Um, and when NVIDIA kind of released their stuff in uh, 1995, it wasn't really something that uh, was available to us to use in from a commercial perspective. Um, again, we were using ATI cards in all of our um, our PCs, our custom built PCs back then. And just to give you, just to frame it for you, and again, I don't want to dwell on the past too much, but um, you got to consider that back in the day, a 386 processor, <laughs> which where is where the you know, and a 286 actually a 286 probably was the first one. Uh, that I touched, um, and a 286 processor was so slow. All right, if you got um, you know 10, 10 megahertz out of it, you were happy. Okay, let's put it that way. It's really slow. Um, and then they they started to speed up, and they 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 were yeah they they had a um, there was a real need for a discrete GPU, something that could pull off graphics because there was a you know you got to remember that we went through a revolution in video. No one had computers back then. And so you gotta, you gotta think of what's happening at the same time uh, back in the day. So, you know, computers weren't prevalent. They weren't in every office space. Uh, you know, we didn't have them on our hip, uh, you know, when we went everywhere. It was, you know, not everyone had them and they were super expensive and large and hot. They ran really, really hot, way hotter than they do today, right? So. For them to come up with something like this was a real evolution in uh, engineering. And something that was programmable, wow, that gave us a lot of power, a lot of stuff to do. And this is way after, remember, the 80s was the video game era, the classic video game era. So in the 90s, we were starting to produce things on PCs, and there was a real demand for uh, high-end graphic workstations. And so NVIDIA and other, and Texas Instruments and ATI, they were the people that kind of you know, responded to that demand. That's enough. I'm going to say anything about more about uh, the past. 
<clears throat> so as complexity increased, um, you know, in terms of uh, our application programming interfaces for, for GPUs, languages started to emerge, uh, like HLSL, GLSL, and CG. Um, you know, there was an extensive, you know, study and sort of research on general purpose uh, computing on GPUs, uh, resulting in all kinds of awesome graphics that we can see today. Uh, but again, it took a lot of time to do. So why do we use the GPU and not a CPU? Um, because at the end of the day, a GPU is made to do different things. It's think about this. We talked about this briefly last week, which is, you know, we're going to have more and more discrete parts. We're going to have a discrete AI chip one day, in my opinion, it's going to get there. They already have one for Apple with their M1 chip, right? A discrete AI component, if you will. We're going to have a discrete, we've already had discrete sound chips. That's been around for as long as I've been around. All right. So that's something that that's out there already. Right. Um, we have discrete GPUs. There's going to be other discrete processors to help uh, the CPU do its job because the CPU is really great at serial, um, you know, calculations for the most part. It can do parallel calculations, but it's not built for parallel calculations like a GPU is built for them, right? And you also got to think about this. It does one instruction at a time really, really well, and it does multitasking for each of its cores. So here's an example of a 9.9. This is the one that I have in my, my machine, a 9.9-10900K, right? This has 10 cores. So each core, it acts as its own CPU. How many cores does the GPU have? This, uh, you know, RTX 3090 that I have pictured on the right. Right, lots and lots of, way more cores than the CPU. So not only is it built for parallel operations, but it also has way more computing capacity for specific types of calculations that the CPU is not built for. It'll take actually a lot longer for the CPU to do the same thing, even if we had the same number of cores, um, as an example, it would take the CPU a little bit longer to do some of the same things, and it would run way hotter, number one, especially this CPU. Um, other CPUs that are out there that are from AMD, and I didn't put those on there, for example, the Threadripper that has uh, 64 cores is great for, uh, for doing things like workstation calculations. Um, and there's some really cool blender tests that you can go online and see, and then compare the 10900K, which lags way behind something like even a simple thread ripper, not the, not the 64 uh, core one or 128 cores, but something even simpler than that. So you got to consider that even with that, the GPUs are just faster. They're just better right now. And they're going to continue to improve right now with this new uh, level of GPU that we've gotten this year, uh, the RTX uh, with real-time ray tracing and path tracing, like we, we mentioned last, uh, last week, it's awesome the stuff that you can you can uh, you can do with your GPU, and it's not just used for graphics like we talked about. It's also used for uh, for machine learning and a bunch of other stuff. So again, um, when it comes to shaders and uh, and GPUs, um, again we use GPUs because of their highly parallel architecture. That's what we use them for. And what they can do is they can manage a lot of things, a lot of data throughput at the same time, right? So think about when you send your verts to a vert, uh, you know, a vertex shader. You're actually sending all of them at the same time, right? You're not sending necessarily one at a time. It is a data stream, but what's happening is the GPU is handling them as as um, with as many of its cores as it can. Different languages emerged. So back in the day, um, well, let's talk about shader languages. I've actually uh, run assembly, not assembly. But assembly, um, you know, and, and NVIDIA kind of used this version, um, you know, back in the day in, in 2000. But I actually ran assembly language um, that maybe you learn about in uh, your computer architecture course um, with Bill. Or, I'm not sure if you're taking it right now or if you took it last semester, but I know that it's, uh, if I'm not wrong, a second year course. But if um, we, we learn assembly language a little bit, and assembly language programming is really low level programming. And if you think about what that's really great for, it's right before this class. Awesome. It's really great to write uh, things like driver code. If you want to write driver code, um, using assembly is probably one of the best ways to do it. Why? You get right uh, deep into the, you know, um, into that particular device. 
However, nowadays we can do a lot of stuff and you can compile into assembly code, into uh, bytecode, as an example, with something like uh, C or C++, right? So you can actually do it that way as well. But back in the day, it started off with uh, with different languages and they've evolved. They've We've tried to access, or at the beginning, it looked more like a driver is what I'm trying to say in 2000. And then later on, we had this higher level uh, coding language. So CG emerged in 2002. HLSL at the same time, finally GLSL in 2003, which is what we're using with OpenGL, and then it's continuing to uh, to evolve. Um, you know, as an example, with Vulkan and uh, with everything else, CUDA and OpenCL and all that other stuff uh, as we move from 2000 into the 2010s. So really cool stuff. Uh, shader shading languages have evolved as well. Um, again, there's currently three major ones. Uh, that we use right now. Plus, we have to also consider um, using Vulkan instead of OpenGL because, again, OpenGL, uh, not a lot of OpenGL games out there uh, lately being uh, constructed. And usually what we do is uh, we use a CG a lot. You're still using CG on HLSL. That's really out there. Um, HL, HLSL, or which is derived from CG, is also used by um, Unity. So you'll see a lot of code if you want to write a code, a shader in Unity, it's going to be a lot different than you would write in OpenGL, but very similar in terms of the uh, the ideas around it, the way it's it's being done, the theory uh, behind writing code, uh, shader code. So that's the main shading languages. Uh, one thing to know is that uh, they're mostly C influenced, so you use curly braces and semicolons for most languages that we've seen. So why C? Um, well, if because it supports things like standard data types that we really love, like things like int, float, double, uh, uint, uh, boolean, and so on. Um, and uh, really, the shader's purpose really is this massive, if you think about this, or this real-time math calculation that's going to return some kind of numbers. And it's usually four of these numbers per vertex, which is red, green, blue, and alpha. That's really what we want to get out of it. Some kind of color per, per pixel at the end for everything that's on the screen. All right, that's what we're going to output. So really C is a um, general purpose programming language, and that's where um, shader language comes from uh, for the most part. It's not C++. So keep in mind that there's some things that you can do in, uh, in C++ and in C, general C, that you can't do in, uh, in GLSL. All right, it just won't fly. Um, so you can see that uh, GLSL has also evolved. It's, it's changed. It started off at 1.1, where it can do things like vertex and fragment shaders. In version 1.5, we had the ability to add geometry shaders, and we'll talk about what those are, as well as tessellation shaders, which is something else that has come up ever since uh, GLSL version 4. All right, So that's what um, the capabilities, the features of the language have improved as well. Let me just go back before we skip. We just skipped a bunch of stuff here. Um, let's get back into the shader pipeline. So this is an example of the shader pipeline. So what happens is we get our verts and they pipe into something called a geometry shader, which is um, optional. That's an op optional step, if you will. And then it goes into the vert shader. And then from there into the rasterizer, through the rasterizer into the fragment shader, and from there into the frame buffer and pixels on the screen. And we've seen this kind of pipeline uh, kind of again, again and again. There's also steps that we've missed, primitive assembly and so on. Take a look at the green items inside of, um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, pipeline. So this is, here's an example of our regular shader pipeline. So we have uh, vertex data, primitive processing, uh, transformation and lighting, primitive assembly, and then rasterizer. This is the old way of doing things. And then take a look at the new one. So again, it's, vertex data, primitive processing, vertex shader, some kind of tessellation control, right? Where this is the tessellation stages, which makes it really awesome. Uh, tessellation shading we'll talk about in a bit. Then it pipes into the geometry shader. By the way, the tessellation stages as well as the geometry uh, uh, stages are optional. We go through prim primitive assembly through the rasterizer, which is your superhero of the entire process, the rasterizer, and then Remember what rasterizer does um, when, whenever we, I always think about uh, Dr. Hogue, when I think of the rasterizer, it chops stuff up, replaces stuff with something else. 
chop stuff up is what he says. Ask him. He'll tell you the same things. Uh, tell him I tell I, I told you guys, and he'll laugh a little bit about it um, because that's how he got us to remember it when we learned it. Um, it goes into the fragment shader, out to the fragment shader, into uh, the depth and stencil sh um, shaders, as well as into the color buffer, uh, and then finally into the frame buffer. That's how it goes. So that's the full OpenGL 4 pipeline. And that's the pipeline you'll be using uh, in this semester. All right, which is something you should have been actually exposed to already in Intro to Graphics. Okay, so again, what is the, the point of the vertex shader? Again, if you think about it, vertex in, vertex out. One by one, but again, handled by multiple cores. So it's happening at the same time. Uh, if you think about this graphic pipeline as being replicated across each core in the GPU, you can see how fast this stuff happens, all right? It's really crazy fast. Um, and it's so fast that we're able to see things in real time. Um, and that's what makes it really, really cool. Um, I'm just going to skip through here to, um, to this part here. Um, one thing to note is there's a couple of mandatory stages. One of them is the vertex shader. So vertex, we have a, you know, kind of a vertex array, you know, example, an element array, we pass into the vertex shader. This is a mandatory step. And then once it runs through the vertex shader, it does things like um, processing data, world coordinates, color values, normal values, your texture coordinates, all that stuff gets passed from the CPU into the GPU through your vertex shader. And then at the other end, after the rasterizer is where we deal with uh, your fragment shader. So again, this is a mandatory step. One thing we want to talk about is the tessellation shader, which is something that's become really popular to use lately. I would say it's been popular for a while, but I think it's something that uh, allows us to um, uh, to do to more like refine uh, and uh, and coarsen an, uh, an object's mesh, which is really really cool. And it it really was put into play for this idea of level of detail management. So. Imagine that I have an object that's very, very far, far away in the screen. Example, uh, I'm looking at a forest of trees, right? And I'm trying to render all the bark and the leaves, the, the textures on the leaves, very, very far away, right? The farther away I get, do I really want to hold all of the detail um, for the bark and the trees for each of the leaves? far, far away into the forest? The answer is no, it's probably gonna be like a dot in the distance. Am I gonna hold all that information in memory is what I'm saying? And the answer is no. And what I'm probably gonna do is use some kind of level of detail as um, objects are farther and farther away uh, from the frustum you know, uh, of my camera, from the near plane. The farther out they are, you know, uh, out towards the, the, the far plane, there's going to be less detail than the ones that are closer up. Why? Because our our eyes tend to focus on the stuff that's close, uh, you know, close into our uh, in our field of view, and then the stuff that's farther out, we don't really care so much about details, right? So that's where we can really take advantage of the tessellation, uh, you know, shader and the whole uh, tessellation stage in order for us to reduce uh, the detail for objects that are far away and modify the mesh, the actual object that is being sent into the uh, into the pipeline for rendering, which is really, really cool. All right, so um, so again, we this is kind of a very high level view of the tessellation shader, and I'm hoping that this semester, Nick will have a chance to show you uh, how that works. There is There are additional steps in implementing this inside of our pipeline, and I'm not sure if, um, if it's already been in place or if is it in place in your Otter uh, assignment framework. All right, um, geometry shader is actually really cool to do. There's a couple of really cool uses for it. One thing is the geometry shader shader really physically changes the the geometry that comes into it. So it does things like really great for bump mapping and for actually producing additional geometry that doesn't exist in your original mesh. For example, I want to have a I, I pass in a torus, let's say as an example, into my pipeline. And I want to make the torus have spikes. Well, I can certainly um, model a torus with spikes beforehand, or I can use a geometry shader with some math to add spikes, almost like normals that come out of the, uh, make it uh, add, add hair and those kind of effects to an object through a geometry shader. 
Geometry traders are really great um, also to add things or to use um, uh, to create particles for. So particle effects and that kind of thing, geometry shader is going to be your friend. You don't want to make each particle a game object. That's insane. It's too crazy. Um, and so we use geometry shaders for that. We do everything GPU side as opposed to CPU side when it comes to particle effects. Uh, examples, things like, especially complicated particle effects like fog and um, particle effects that have transparency and those kind of things. Definitely, you want to run them through a shader, a geometry shader, as opposed to do it on the CPU side. It's just way too slow, um, and it'll make your uh, it'll increase the computation that'll happen throughout your game and slow down your frame rate. Would you be playing with the the verts? No, you're gonna again. You would, but you're gonna be doing a calculation. So you're actually it's gonna go through a process, and again, hopefully, uh, Nick is gonna have a chance to. Um, to show you how to use the geometry shader. I think it's really exciting and it's fun uh, to use the geometry shader to modify, uh, you know, kind of the mesh that you're loading um, from your program. So look out for that. If I can do it with you guys, if there's uh, something we can do offline, I'd like to try and do that with you too. I think it's some great uh, stuff you can do with the geometry shader. And there's also, by the way, a lot of these slides that I have have YouTube videos attached. Take a look at this YouTube video that's attached to, attached to the geometry shader. It's pretty awesome. All right, um, so one thing that it does is also do something called layered rendering, uh, which is we can layer multiple images uh, without having to change um, you know, the targets and so forth. That's really something that, that it does well. And of course, it does transformations on your original mesh, which is really cool. Okay, so things like a bump map and all that kind of stuff, you can actually do in real time with a geometry shader, which is awesome. Just going to move on here uh, from this. And again, lots of really cool videos that are attached on the bottom. Uh, particles is a great video about how you can use your geometry shader for particles. Take a look at that when you have a chance. Um, hey, this is the part where we try and program shaders on the web together. Let's do it. Let's see if we can if we can do this thing uh, on the web with Shader Toy. So this is an example of how to do that. And I talked about Shader Toy earlier today, but let's try it live. So again. If I go to shadertoy.com, hopefully it's not broken. I'm going to click new. And what you can do with Shader Toy is wipe out uh, pretty much all this stuff, right? And notice on the PowerPoint slide, I'm going to skip some of these slides, but notice on the PowerPoint slide that all it has is this frag color with a VEC4. So if I take this and replace everything here, um, actually, we just can just do this, just replace, get rid of this, and put in a VEC4, right? inside of, of Shader Toy, we can stop this from cycling and just change the color. So change the color to whatever you want. So let's go to something like um, R, G, make it make B zero and uh, A uh, one, and you modify it and right away you have a yellow color. And that's really, really cool. Um, that's how fast it is to, uh, to try it out on online. And um, it's really good. We're going to try this throughout. So we'll keep this up. But here's an example of how to change the color uh, very simply. You can also, of course, define a, um, a variable for this. So let's say, for example, I have a VEC3 um, as an example, which is called, uh, we'll call it color, right? And then we can say that it's a VEC3 that houses all that stuff. We can break down uh, the color into both VEC uh, kind of a, a color value and then kind of install it right here. We can just kind of pop it in there, right? So then let's just actually call it call instead of color just to make sure that it doesn't collide with one of its own uh, built-ins. And if you notice that we have no difference, right? If I change this thing to something higher, let's say for example, I go to two, right? It's still not gonna do anything because you can't go beyond uh, white. White is white is white, right? So sure, you can put another value. It's not gonna complain, but it can take higher values. Um, but let's say, for example, I turn this off, let's make it red. So you can see that just to prove that you can just Im implant a, uh, a color value or, uh, uh, interject or inject a color value in there. You can totally do that. It's no problem at all. Yeah, it, 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 it can feel bad if you're only doing 60 frames per second, but you gotta, you know, remember that our, our human persistence of vision is only 24 frames, right? So you can do a lot with 60 frames per second. 
All right, let's get back to, to this. So this is an example of how we can do shaders live on the web. And we're going to do more about this with Visual Studio Code. All right. And like I said, we can do more offline, not just the online stuff. So um, here, as an example, is what they did. They kind of created here a solid red color and used that for the frag color. But, um, and what the frag coordinate holds is the pixels X and Y coordinates. Uh, and Z, if we're working in, in 3D, that's what it does, right? So here is an example of another shader. Let's see if we can copy paste this right from our PowerPoint slide and see what it does. So I'm just going to copy paste this shader right in here. So here it is. And now we get this. We get a vector 2, right, which is X and Y coordinates. Notice that we're using swizzling, um, which is something you should be learning about. Swizzling means um, maybe the frag coordinate has X, Y, and Z coordinates, as an example. And in, in fact, the frag coordinate has X, Y, Z, and W coordinates. Notice it's a VEC4, right? But all we care about is X and Y in this particular case, right? So we can take our, sorry, that's frag coordinates. Uh, frag coordinates is just uh, X and Y. Frag color is RGBA. Um, so um, so if you take this as an example, all we need about, all we need is X and Y. I can also take just the X value, but this is an example of just swizzling. And then here's our solid color, which is red. And then we have an if statement. Hey, question for you guys out there. If statements, are they good to put in shaders? Yes or no? Should you put them in? What say you? No, they're very bad. Why? It's branching. Any kind of crazy branching in a shader is like the worst thing you can possibly do. It's better to sample what you want to do from a, from a texture than to use some kind of branching like this. This is a terrible idea, right? However, um, if we save it, you can see now what we do, what we have is kind of a split screen effect happening, right? We're saying, hey, look, if my, uh, from my look at my X and Y coordinates on the screen, right? If I look at any X value that is greater than 300, I want to apply, I want to make my solid red color as an example one. And this is kind of a not a great name for the uh, for the color because really it's not solid red, it's black, right? Right now it's black right now. And then here we're taking that black color or the color value. Let's just rename this thing to color, right? Because that's what it should be named, color.red, right? And we're saying, hey, take the color and we just need the red channel, make that red channel fully on, and we'll turn it to red only when the pixels are greater than 300 pixels, right? That's what it does, right? If we change this value around, we'll make it greater than 200 pixels and we save it, then it'll be, if we don't make a, a mistake and we don't say solid red there, and then you'll see that it starts earlier. Or if we do something later on, then it'll start later. You can you know, set up the split any way you want. So again, one big mathematical formula to create an effect live on the internet. But again, we don't want to do this. We'd rather sample, that's what we'd rather do. We'd rather sample from uh, a texture for us to tell us when this is going to happen or use some other kind of formula to do this because branching, my friends, is a bad thing, especially when it comes to shader. All right, so that is, um, you know, it talks about how to make a gradient. And this is the first step on how to make a gradient. It shows us the effect right here and it keeps going and it talks about how to um, use some additional uh, pieces. Now here, take a look at this. We're using um, our eye resolution and eye resolution gives us our res the, re the screen resolution. That's where we're getting from this, right? And what are we doing here when we're taking the, um, the X coordinate and we're reassigning it, the X coordinate, dividing it by the I resolution that X. What are we doing here when we're doing this? Why are we dividing the coordinates by the screen size? What for? Does anyone know? Why would I do this? Well, when I do this, yes. But what what I'm actually doing when I do this, when I when I divide by the uh, by the uh, screen resolution. So the actual coordinates by the screen ratio, I get a I get a, a normalized aspect ratio. That's what I'm getting here, right? Because right now my screen coordinates, um, anything I draw on the screen will be skewed according to how wide my screen is. However, if I was to change my coordinates, so if I just took this this little piece here and go back up here and put that in, right? So I said, okay, I'm just reassigning what my X and Y values are for X and Y. Think about these as the UV coordinates, which is really what these should be, right? 
um, if you think about this, right? So this is really UV, right? Um, then I'm taking my UV on the X, the X value and the Y value, and I'm I'm normalizing it, right? So now notice, notice what happens is it goes away. The split goes away. Why? Because this is not the same anymore. In fact, this value is 500. What should I put here as an as is as, as instead of 500? If I've normalized my values, and what uh, normalization? What does that mean? Normalization means anywhere between zero and one, right? So if I put 0.5 in here and save, then you can see now I'm back to this. So I've normalized my coordinate frame. That's what I've done, right? Normalizing means taking the number and dividing it by kind of some kind of range. And you're you're getting a number between zero and one. Okay. All right. So that's what this does, and that's why we have this idea down here because you're getting half the screen. And this is actually really useful because we can uh, apply it to any screen size as opposed to. Um, oh, that's interesting. Um, as opposed to anything that we have here. So if I put in some other value, let's say for example I put in 0.15, then you're going to see it's going to start way earlier than where it started before, like way over here, 15% of the screen size. All right, so that is what that does. Um, if you want to add the gradient, then um, what's going to be happening, if you go back up there to that little thing, add in the gradient. So we haven't touched anything here. And notice what we're doing is we're still making it black. And we're saying that the it's solid red, right? But to the normalized value, the normalized value, we can use a mix function, that's awesome. Uh, there's also mix and smooth and a bunch of other really cool functions that are out there as well that you can totally use. Um, but what if I was to do this? If I took this solid red, which is color.r, and I said xy.x. So instead of doing this, so I don't do branching, I say color.red, the red color is equal to xy.x. And if I was to do that and kind of you know, kind of run it, you can see that there is now a gradient. And how does this work, right? So it says that for every X value, right, as we approach, um, you know, kind of the right, it moves more and more into more values of red. So the red color is going to be changing. Remember, it goes from zero to one, right? As you move across the screen, as this becomes one, the full size of the screen, so too does the red color fully turn on. As it becomes zero from zero, the red color is all off, and there's going to be a gradient in between, and that's how it works. Okay, so that's how you can do it very simply. All right, so that is an example of shader toy, and again, I don't want to time out, so I'm going to move on. Um, so again, we're moving into the talking about the uh, fragment shader. That's the other required, um, you know, kind of step in the pipeline. Um, again. Vertex is one step that's required. The other one is fragment. And what we do is it it kind of processes a single pixel only. It has no access to the rest of them. The rest of them. And then what it does is it takes in data and shoots out color. That's what it's going to do. It takes in data and colors or change the color of every pixel on the screen. That's what it kind of does. All right. And really, that's the purpose of your fragment shader at a very high level. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that goes on to create those colors. Because if you combine colors on the screen, suddenly you have an image. Suddenly you have 3D. Suddenly you have all kinds of stuff. That's really, really cool. So um, so yeah, so that's why the, we're going to be working with vertex and fragment shaders more than anything else. And uh, again, it says here it's a mandatory uh, stage. By the way, a lot of these links that you'll see here, they're actual links that you can click in, in on, the, um, on the PowerPoint slide for additional information. So it's packed full of information here. So please, uh, I would ask you when you look through your slides, click on some of these things, take a look at some of the YouTube videos that are attached to some really great work uh, that's been connected to this thing and lots and lots more detail that I can possibly cover in an hour and a half with you, which has actually turned into more like an hour. Okay, so that's really what it is. Um, when, it, when we talk about fragments, again, we're talking about pixel fragments. That's what we're talking about. And uh, the way it's really working is you have um, a bunch of inputs. And then what the fragment shader done, does is it colors a lot of the, uh, the pixels between these colors. It does some interpolation. Um, and interpolation means is it takes the color between green and red and fills in the details. It does that for us. 
so it creates the texture that we're going to see on the screen. That's what it does. That's what the fragment shader really does for us. Okay. Um, again, our triangle has only three verts, but one fragment, uh, you know, for every pixel sized area of the surface. Okay, which is really what we're getting from that. We kind of said the same things. Back to Shader Toy. Shader Toy also has the ability for us to input um, not just uh, colors, but also images. So if you notice some of the more advanced effects of Shader Toy, um, uh, you can also include things like um, sound, and you can use your webcam. There's a lot of other inputs that I can do uh, than just um, what we see so far, which was just you know coloring. Um, and, and, and the background and doing some simple shading effects. Lots of stuff that Shader Toy uh, can do. So I invite you guys to try and look in that. And that's part of your in-class assignment, which I'm going to skip this part because this is talking about visualizing an image. Um, a fragment shader, um, this is the difference kind of between per vertex lighting, which is part of the things that um, you're going to see. So per vertex lighting. And then here's per fragment lighting. See how it becomes much nicer, much sharper. Um, you know, kind of the difference between one and the other. And the frag fragment shader helps us get to this effect, right? Um, again, one thing to note is the process to, uh, to, to create a shader program executable. Um, this, this uh, right now what's happening is a lot of stuff happening on the background in Otter that you're going to see that's going to enable us to, um, you know, kind of take the shader code from your frag um you know file or from your vert file as an example and make it usable in the whole pipeline uh in your um in your framework that you're using for your assignments right and some of it is we're taking a character string and we're using the uh the shader object or we're bringing it into a compiled shader object so it's compiling the program and then from there we're going to get a compiled shader object also another one that's going to come in and we're using this, this as a program object overall to create a shader program executable that we're going to be using in the final process. And how does that look uh, in code? Because uh, shader programs is, is are, are what we're going to be using. And I'm sorry to, to rush you here. Uh, but it uses, we talked about parallelism already. I'm just going to skip, skip, skip. It, it kind of uses something that looks like this. So we have, just like we saw on shader toy, something very sim similar to that. We have some kind of inputs, some kind of outputs, some kind of uniform which connects to the CPU, and then a main program that runs, um, you know, kind of all of our stuff. And that's kind of what our, our a shader would look like, okay? And we've seen that before. And the shader version number would go on the top. So you're going to see that when you work with Nick on Friday. Um, GLSL operators and data types. One thing to know is that you can use both operators and uh, and C++. So C and C++ work. So all the same operators, plus equals, all the shortcut operators, those kind of things. But no pointers. So don't try and use pointers at all in, um, in shader code. That would be really weird if, if it had that. Um, there's also several GLSL data types that are built in. VEC3, VEC4, uh, Matrix3, and a Matrix4 sampler 2d sampler cube and so on there's a lot of built-in data types that we're going to tap into on a regular basis with glsl so these are the ones that you're going to mostly see okay um and one thing to note is there's several file naming conventions that you're going to go through vert and frag obviously are are things that you're going to see sometimes we'll see it as a texture map or a particle and geom is usually a geometry shader all right so that's kind of the way we use our um, and it's just a naming convention. It could be anything. Some people use just V and F, right? I mean, I've seen a lot of, uh, of different uh, variations here, but these are the most common. And finally, um, there's some coding tips. Like I talked about before, some text editors like Notepad++, Gedit, and VS Code specifically, like we talked about, will do syntax highlighting for GLSL. You can also download an extension for GLSL for Visual Studio uh, proper, Visual Studio 2019 that'll give you some syntax highlighting. And it's super important to see that as opposed to a white text. I don't know about you, but for me, syntax highlighting and code hinting uh, and all that kind of stuff is really cool. Um, one thing that uh, you can do with VS Code and some additional extensions is it'll actually give you code hinting, which is way better than I've seen with Visual Studio 2019 so far. 
And what I mean by that is you hover over it and it'll give you what that, um, what that object is in VS Code. So example, if I was in VS Code and if I had code hinting uh, effect in effect, I could literally just hover over this uh, circle shape or uh, the position or the color or rectangle or the, the frag color as an example, and it would give me what these things are. What, what is a VEC for? That kind of thing. Right now I'm getting no code hinting, but I'm at, but I am getting code coloring and code coloring also helps us because it allows us to, uh, you know, to work, to work better with debugging and so on. On that, we're going to be doing some debugging with our code and things like render doc and other, um, kind of tools, um, you're going to be using extensively this semester with Nick, um, to debug some of the output that you're going to get from your, your programs. Okay, so we're going to be talking about more about that in your tutorial. Um, and that's it for my tutorial and my or my uh, my uh, lecture. Uh, one thing I wanted to go back to is a reminder. Let's remind you about what's happening for next week. Again, uh, look for and I figured this out now the asynchronous portion that I'm going to review the pipeline, uh, the graphics pipeline in way more detail with math. <laughs> so for people who love the math, it's coming. It's just going to be in the uh, kind of be offline in this uh, tutorial slide uh, or in this lecture slide that you're going to see later on, lecture 2B. Uh, that's coming up. Um, next week, like I said, assignment one is due on the Sunday. So I would get a jump on that as soon as possible. Get that uh, Otter framework up and running. That's what I would ask you to do, um, as well as um, your checkpoint one. So if you don't have a team, like I said earlier, get together with the team. Um, uh, as soon as possible, like some of those, some of the people that uh, kind of mentioned today, um, that they don't have a team. Again, connect offline on Discord or uh, worst case scenario, uh, connect with me, and then I can I can put you guys together. No, I'm gonna Christian. I'm gonna I'm gonna post that later on. But the assignment one details and the GW details, um, GW details I'm gonna post later. Assignment one details I've already been posted and I've talked about them earlier today. Any questions around the stuff that we talked about today before we depart? So I know our our uh, our note taker is probably saying, okay, you're almost done, Tom, and I got to go to the next one. Uh, for non-GW, what would we have to do for checkpoint one? Um, it would be the same. So what I'm going to ask you for as an example is show me uh, maybe an idea of what you want to render for your game. So, I mean, I want to, I want you to think about making a simple scene uh, or a simple game using, uh, you know, 3D with OpenGL. Make it a game. So there must be some kind of, uh, as an example, um, a goal for the game. It's got to be very simple. I'm not going to ask, uh, you know, for you guys to make it a full GGW game, um, you know, as an example, or very complex. It could be something like a and I'll give you some examples uh, in the in in the notes, but something like um, a platform runner where you're just like you know running from one platform to the other, and you want to get to the to the you know to a goal, um, you know that kind of thing. Something that's very straightforward. What if you've already taken GW two but haven't taken this course before? Um, yeah, that means that I would like you to make something very straightforward. If you have some example from your GW two that you want to bring in, like let's say for example you have older code. You did before. Uh, maybe you and your your um, your partners worked on some code, and you want to take an essence of that and use it. Um, you know, some of it again as a framework. I'm okay with that. However, I think that'll probably make it more difficult than just starting something that's very simple and new. Uh, I'm not going to produce something that is another assignment for you guys. I think it's going to be way more complex for you to make something uh, make something else that's comparable to GDW. Exactly. Let's see if you can make uh, figure out how to make uh, how to load objects. Okay, so I'm going to stop recording on YouTube now. I'm going to hang back for any questions, but officially the lecture is over. Uh, for those people who are watching on YouTube, thank you so much. I'll see you guys next week. Um, otherwise, look for the asynchronous portion later on today. Okay, any questions 